and from our evolutionary past. There is a lot of junk in there, undoubtedly. But the thing which I want to emphasise is it's actually quite straightforward to go and sequence, to get the order of letters, junk and, and meaning, all, the whole thing. Now, that's 3,000 million letters. Sounds quite a lot, but it's not actually that much in terms of computation. With a little compression, you can write it on a single CD-ROM. You can actually have a CD-ROM which contains the instructions to make a human being. Nobel Prize winner Professor Solston oversaw the Human Genome Project, perhaps the most far-reaching scientific venture ever. At a cost of three billion dollars, it drew together scientists from 18 countries across the world. Its goal? To find and record every gene in the human body. Taking samples of DNA from the average population, they looked for regular areas of activity, the genes common to all of us. Every single one was then plotted on a map. This is the human genome. After 10 years, they now know where almost all of our 35,000 genes are located. But the real task has barely begun. Yes, I mean, what we've done with the, with the human sequence is to, is to read the book. We've read the string of letters on the pages, OK? We haven't or we've only just begun to figure out which of those letters really mean anything. Work has already begun to test each and every human gene to work out what it does. Scientists can now make an artificial gene and put it inside a cell. The model gene has a color which allows them to see what proteins it is making. Once the gene is profiled, every detail is published. All across the world, genetic labs are in a race to profile the gene combinations that make us predisposed to major illnesses. Obesity is one of the biggest health problems in America. It's estimated that a third of the nation is obese. As a health issue, it is huge, because one of the legacies of obesity is diabetes the sixth biggest killer in the US. But while genetics companies are looking for the genes for obesity, not everyone is convinced that genes alone will ever tell us the whole story. Almost everybody watching this program will die of a genetic disease. And by that I simply mean that things like diabetes, cancer, heart disease, all the big killers, nearly all of them have a strong inherited component. But crucially, in all those big genetic killers of the modern world, the environment is very much involved. For example, if you've got a familial tendency towards diabetes, as many, many people do, the preferred treatment is not to do gene therapy, but to stop eating sweets, to stop eating lard. Hold your tummies in, swing your arms, okay. <laughs> hips in, up and under. <laughs> Philadelphia has one of the highest rates of obesity in America, but it's also home to a major campaign to combat obesity and diabetes. Swing those arms. Gwen Foster is the city's health czar, charged with getting the city's employees into shape. For those like Gwen on the front line, the promise of a future gene test is less than helpful now. I have a fear that uh, if people are identified with a specific gene for a disorder, then they will say that there's no hope and just waiting for med medical science to come up with the pill or the, the cure, which is likely not to happen in a lifetime. And the other thing, yes, is that uh, people uh, will feel if there is not the genetic code displayed by whatever testing, that they're scot-free. Faulty genes, I always say, may load the gun but it's lifestyle that pulls that trigger. While they work on their lifestyles in Philadelphia, some scientists believe that genetics may still hold the key to predicting complex conditions like diabetes. But there will need to be another phase in the genetics revolution first. Something like obesity is a very complex set of disorders. Maybe one gene uh, deals with five or 10% of the picture there's companies like Muriad that are trying to find them and sell them one at a time. Uh, that's their business model, uh, but it can only give a tiny piece of the picture. Craig Venter, a pioneer of the Human Genome Project, believes genetic science has to start getting personal. 
So one size doesn't fit all. While we nearly have identical physiologies, there are differences. We all differ in one out of roughly 1,200 letters of the genetic code from each other. Sometimes those differences uh, lead, obviously, to some different physical characteristics, but they also lead to some different responses to the environment. And the way medicine is practiced now, we sort of deal with everything as an average. Venter's dream is to offer us all our own genome for just a thousand dollars. Only this, he believes, will allow us to tailor our health care and lifestyle effectively to the genes we individually possess. There's subpopulations of people that if they smoke, their death rate goes up exponentially over other people that smoke, right? So if you know you're in that risk group, that extra risk group, it might give you even more motivation to change your behavior. In his vision of the future, every child will leave the maternity ward with all his DNA stored in a CD. By the time he's an adult, he will be able to see all his genetic risks. The problem is, others will want to see them too. One of the biggest issues arising from genetic information is the health and life insurance of the future. Imagine a world a few years from now where we have all our DNA stored in a CD. By then, scientists will have worked out what every gene mutation in the human body actually does. Who loves us today, then? No one. Sam's insurance company want to know if he's got a specific mutation that might make him more prone to lung cancer. One such gene you feel may be of relevance to you, given your record as a former smoker. Oh, yeah, here we go. There are serious issues we need to deal with. We need to deal with the privacy of the information, uh, who has access to it, we have to deal with risk of employers, governments, insurance companies potentially abusing or misusing the information. Come here, let me have a look. Come on. If you buy a notion that a gene will cause you to have cancer at age 35, uh, then if you're an insurance company, you'd want to use that information. If you're an employer, you probably wouldn't want to employ the person. You have got it. Look. All over the world in the 21st century, the next generation is going to demand their right to privacy, their right to genetic privacy, their right not to have this information about them used as a form of discrimination or misuse or abuse of their person. Do you know something? I can't believe this. Yesterday I was healthy and I was insurable. Today I'm healthy and I'm uninsurable. This is a vision of a possible future. Across the world, rules vary widely on whether genetic information can be used for insurance purposes. In the UK today, companies cannot use it to set premiums because of an agreed moratorium. We are moving steadily to a situation at the moment where there are more tests available and more people are having them. Yes, and insurers sooner or later, when we get to that type of situation, are going to have to have access to some information, even if they can't rate people on it just so that they know what the costs incurred are, so that they can protect their other policyholders and their shareholders against a potential hit. Most insurance companies in the UK are reluctant to be the first to ask for access because of public anxiety over genetic information. I think people are genuinely frightened about this type of information. It is new. It could be put to all different sorts of uses, not just insurance, and I think we need to respect that. As well as discrimination, there is a deeper issue. The most fundamental information about you may actually belong to someone else.